Jake Mosby. I'm the program coordinator for the Resource Center for Sexual and Gender Diversity. Thank you so much for joining us for um, our Trans Revolution Series community panel. Um, so for those of y'all who don't know, our Trans Revolution Series is a recurring series where we bring um, trans speakers to the UCSB campus from various walks of life to talk about their experiences and what they have done. Um, but we also found that it was really important to talk about the folks who are present here now in our community, who are doing that work, who are present with us. So um, we have an amazing panel for y'all um, today. Unfortunately, one of our members, um, Patrick Lyra, was unable to make it. Um, however, they send their best wishes. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with our land acknowledgement. So before we commence, we wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this place and all land upon which the university and we as individuals are located. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, and the culture of these areas, which have become a place of learning for people from all over the world. We would like to ask folks to remind themselves to never ask Indigenous folks to do your land acknowledgement. They acknowledge their stolen land each and every day. Um, for those of you all who are not currently situated at UCSB on Chumash land, um, you can actually go to native-land.ca and learn, learn more about the um, cultures and tribes upon whose land you reside upon now. So I'm going to go ahead and hop into the bios of our amazing panelists. So first up, we have Han Kaylee. They use they them pronouns. Han is a health equity researcher and activist who serves as UCSB's health equity advisor. They developed the health equity initiative following a coalition student movement demanding health care justice for queer and trans students. Han holds a BA in sociology from UCSB and will graduate in May with a master of social work from University of Southern California. Han is also a founding member of Moral Support Consulting Collective, a trans-owned firm bringing interdisciplinary and activist-centered lessons to justice-minded organizations. Next on the panel, we have Sky Limon. They use they, them, AOS pronouns. Sky holds a BA in sociology from UCSB and an MS in communication from Purdue University. They currently support LGBTQ training and programming for youth and older adults, as well as harm reduction programming programming for Pacific Pride Foundation, the LGBTQ plus center for the Central Coast. Prior to work at Pacific Pride Foundation, Sky worked at UCSB in various departments supporting students and staff members. While at UCSB, they were the co-president of the LGBTQ plus staff and faculty collective and on the RGSGD advisory board. Sky is passionate about serving underrepresented communities, more specifically LGBTQ plus folks of color and Spanish speaking communities. And last but certainly not least is Natalie Armistead. She uses she, her pronouns. Natalie is the basic needs coordinator for UC Santa Barbara. In her role, she oversees the financial crisis response team and all of the basic needs programs associated with it. Her team works to assist students who are facing any sort of housing, food, or technological insecurity through emergency financial aid, transitional housing, meal plan scholarships, and a whole host of other resources that are available to us. We know that many students, especially those from underrepresented groups, have been negatively affected by the global pandemic, so their team is working um, their hardest to assist in any way that they can. Prior to taking the position at UCSB, she worked at Brock University in the Office of Human Rights and Equity, where she developed anti-transphobia and anti-sexual violence programs for the community. She believes the most effective way to promote human rights is through education, and that positive cultural change really begins with higher ed institutions. And last, before I finally shut up, is Aaron. Um, Aaron is our trans empowerment coordinator. He uses he, they pronouns, and he will be your moderator for the remainder of this session. Um, Aaron will have to step out at a certain point. So if before we finish the questions, Aaron has to leave, I will step in and resume the questions from there. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to y'all. Thank you, Duane, for that lovely, wonderful introduction. So hello, everyone. My name is Aaron, and I'm going to be the moderator for uh, until I have to get off. Uh, so yeah, so first of all, just, I just want to say welcome to the panelists. Thank you for being here and happy kickoff to our Trans Month of Visibility celebration. Uh, so I know doing just finished giving y'all's wonderful introductions, but I'm wondering if uh, we can start off by y'all telling us a little bit more about yourselves and how you are involved with trans justice work. And if Han, you want to start, we could like maintain the order of how to introduce y'all or like switch it up, up to y'all. Sure. Um... Yeah, so I think the way that I got involved with trans justice work was being in community with trans people. Even before I transitioned, um, trans friends that I had told me about the experiences they had of struggling to get adequate healthcare 
And one of the first issues I became involved with was um, sort of low interest in developing surgical technologies and the high degree of just sort of shrugging acceptance at some of the risks uh, associated with surgical technologies not being developed at the same pace that you would want them to be. And so I really got involved with trans health with the idea that I would try to become a surgeon and develop cutting edge uh, transition surgical techniques. And then I was like, well, if I wanna, if I wanna practice medicine, I really want to have a strong baseline in social science so that I'm able to connect with people and understand what's shaping their experiences on a macro level. And then when I got to UCSB, I realized like it, it might be possible for me to help a lot more people than I could ever treat as an individual clinician if instead of being a surgeon, I'm teaching surgeons and <laughs> connecting with surgeons and, and trying to talk to as many surgeons as I possibly can. And so I ended up thinking about pursuing a more advocacy and teaching related um, path. And then I was having trouble accessing healthcare myself. And so I ended up getting involved with activism at UCSB because of the experiences that I was having. And one of the things that really made that possible was I participated in gender inclusive housing at UCSB, which is a phenomenal program that helps pair um, trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming people with other folks in that community. So instead of having these experiences by myself in isolation, I was having these experiences and my roommates were having these experiences and it gave us this immediate sense of community of like, it's not just one of us, it's all of us in different ways or all of us, I should say, who were pursuing medical transition, which is not everyone. Um, and so it, it gave us sort of a built-in community from which to build power and connect with other people. And then there was a town hall event where um, yet other people shared their experiences. And it made me realize like, we need, we need to come together. We need to make a change immediately. And that's what happened. So there's still a lot of work to be done, and um, I will I will happily speak on behalf of um, all of the UCSB healthcare facilities that we all know that, um, and we're very clear on that. But I will also say that like things have changed a lot at UCSB since I was a student here, and even within the sociology department, things are so different now than they were even a few years ago. So it's it's really beautiful to stay connected with that community and see um how much of a change we've made and then the um the moral support consulting collective was having done this work for several years other people started to approach me and say oh you know how to do this um can you you know can you come do it with us and i was like well a no i don't have time but b <laughs> i didn't do this by myself you know this was an entire group of people and it's also not a coincidence that you know a at the time very mass presenting um white person was privileged for that job offer and not everybody on that team got treated the same way i did by ucsb and so part of my work now is that as people are looking at what i've done with ucsb and gotten credit for doing at ucsb i'm like how do i redirect that glory and those dollars towards the people who got pushed out of UCSB, who did not graduate, who did not get offered jobs where they were paid well, who did not get treated well by the same people who treated me well. So that's some of the work that I'm doing now and um, looking forward to figuring out how to stay connected and continue doing the work in the future. Thank you for sharing that. Um, when you were talking about potentially becoming a surgeon and you said cutting edge technology, I was like, ah, literally, you could really develop that. But thank you so much for the work you're doing. Uh, it's, yeah, no, it's really important stuff. And I think that starting off with education is such an important like way to go about it. Like now you're reaching even more people. So thank you for that. Uh, Sky, would you like to go next? 
Sure, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I um, identify as pansexual and non-binary. Um, I actually just started growing into my gender identity less than a year ago. Um, my gender expression changed um, and I've been sort of messing around with it, seeing what feels good. Um, I always knew from like age four that I was not a girl. I did not want to be a girl. I didn't like anything that had to do with being a woman. Um, and so after like growing into my own sexuality and realizing, you know, I'm not bisexual, I'm actually pansexual. And like, this is what this means. And um, it's fluid and just learning about myself, being comfortable, being surrounded by community um, really helped me gain the uh, confidence and empower me to really look into like what gender was for me and have the support uh, that I needed to be able to like feel comfortable expressing my gender and feel safe. Um, and it's something that I still haven't talked to about my family. Um, I also, so I've been doing things like, you know, pronouns and um, choosing a, a different name, which is difficult because my, you know, my parents and my family still call me by my dead name. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm still at the very beginning of my journey and I don't know quite yet if I, you know, want to transition one day. Um, I definitely feel more masculine most times than um, feminine and sometimes I just feel like neither. Um, so, you know, in a couple of years, who knows where I will be. Um, I've definitely, you know, considered the idea of, of taking hormones in the future. Um, but I think it's just another stage of like my journey, right? Like I've, I've, mm -hmm. you know, been comfortable with sexuality and then now I'm coming into my gender identity and like really knowing what non-binary feels like. And then also being faced with the challenge of, you know, being misgendered, like Han said, it's, I'm realizing that it's something that is just going to happen almost every day of my life if I'm going anywhere basically so it's something that I'm you know coming not coming to terms with I'm very uh, I like to advocate for myself and for others and so the part of my work um, how I started uh, really realizing that trans work um, was something that was near to my heart is working at Pacific Pride Foundation the LGBT Center in Santa Barbara um, because even though, you know, our org is not just for trans people as a person who's non-binary and uh, representing people who are uh, gender non-conforming, I'm able to at least bring that into the conversation and, um, with our trainings, we're able to, uh, educate folks. So businesses in town, whoever wants a training from us, you know, really talk to them about what gender identity is and how. Uh, much a negative impact misgendering a person does and how important it is to like be welcoming of everybody and how important it is to use neutral language and and go away from like mrs sir or like hi ladies and gentlemen things like that where it's something so natural to our community but it's something that is not thought of outside of this community and it's something that's really important even just language uh, to begin with. So um, I think it's sort of like a selfish endeavor in a way, like through my experience, I am able to learn about myself and learn about what, um, you know, what empowers me, what challenges me, what strengthens me. And then I can then uh, be that role model and be that support system in the community, especially because of the role that I have at Pacific Pride Foundation, where I can actually access folks who don't know this information and give them the you know, the data and give them the, the training that they need to hopefully, you know, create a safer space for more people. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing and congrats on starting your gender exploration journey. I think, you know, something that's really beautiful uh, is that gender sexuality is fluid. So you can always like explore and change and it's just, yeah, it's a really good, good time. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, Natalie, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think like a lot of people, I got involved in sort of trans uh, and social justice work because of my own experiences and wanting to sort of pass it on to the next group or, or make it things easier or better for the people who come after us uh, with a lot of resources. So um, I actually did my, my MA at Brock University in Classics and my field of study was specifically uh, gender nonconforming history in sort of the ancient Greek and Roman and Mesopotamian world. So I studied a lot of uh, mythology and, and real life people who um, existed and, and sort of came before us. And part of that was because I think that history is really important to culture and, and understanding where you've come from is, is part of knowing who you are. So for me, that was, that was an exploration for myself. And then 
while I was doing that work and doing my master's, someone suggested to me that I uh, take a position in this newly formed human rights office at the school. And this was an office that had been formed uh, out of people who'd been doing work in different areas of the school, anti-racism, anti-ableism, uh, sexual violence, support work. And they were all coming together to sort of form a new office and they needed people to get involved with that. So I got involved there and uh, through that, I learned so much about so many different uh, topics. My eyes were opened on things that I didn't realize before. And uh, my own view of the world was sort of broadened uh, and, and I, I became really passionate about that. So uh, when a position opened up in uh, UCSB for the basic needs coordinator as the head of the financial crisis response team, uh, I decided to take that last year and I thought, you know, if we're in the middle of a global pandemic, uh, financial crisis, you know, this seems like a really good time, nice big challenge. So I thought this would be a really good next step. And um, while currently the work I do isn't so LGBTQ plus specific, it, it's broad and it's open to all UCSB students. Um, we do see a disproportionate number of students from underrepresented groups like the queer community uh, reaching out for resources because they just don't have that elsewhere. And, and this might be the best option for them. So that's currently what we're working on and we're trying our best to sort of serve uh, as many students as we can and, and get through this pandemic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much for that work. Uh, and all of all three of you mentioned um, the importance of like community and, uh, you know, entering these spaces and seeing the lack of resources that cater to y'all, to us. And, you know, a lot, lots of times, in most cases, I feel like, this work is started up because of that lack that we see for ourselves. And, you know, oftentimes like people, like trans people have to like make those first steps and start developing those resources. So my next question is, in your opinion, how important is being visible as trans folk to the overall queer and trans justice movement? And uh, really anybody can start or we can maintain like the same. Okay. Or Han, would you like to go? Sure. Um, I want to say that obviously not everyone can be visible in all instances, and I think there there's never an obligation to. Well, I the balance of um, good for you versus good for your community is complicated. And so I don't want to say that there's like a prescriptive, everyone should do this at all times, because that's just not real. But somebody needs to be visible. Um, and I think that when people take on the risks, um, which are sometimes very great to be visible, um, it's necessary. And I see the people like you know, our foremothers at Stonewall who were not in positions of cushiness. Um, and also like visibility is not a choice that everyone can make, um, particularly for people who are trans feminine, there's often not an option to not be visible. And for people who are non-binary, there's often not an option. So I think that the question of like, how visible should you be often kind of doesn't get at the reality of, well, like, what is the other choice that's available to me? Um, like, my, my body is visibly non-binary. If I said nothing about who I was, it would still be there. Um, and so that's, that's carried into my interactions. And yes, that interacts with choices that I've made, but that's also it's just there it's it's just there um and so there's ways in which like I can't not be visible um even at the level of like my resume you can't look at my resume even if I strip off my name and pronouns and come away thinking like this is a cis person like it's just not a possible thing to conclude from my resume and that's that's going to limit me in some ways um and it's fine and so there are people who are constantly navigating, like, do I want to take a job at the RCSGD? What's that going to say about me um, when I try to go get another job? And in some ways, it means that, like, yeah, I've chosen a direction, and that's the direction I can continue moving in, and it would be hard to switch 
to switch course. But some people need to do that um, in order for things to happen. And also, even people who are really out aren't always really out. Um, I, if you've added me on my Facebook, which has a lot of public content, my pronouns are different than the pronouns I use at work. Um, I'm super, super out kind of, um, because I'm also navigating like how accessible is my actual identity and where's the balance between being completely 100% real and being able to do my work and feel okay in my work and like, who am I leaving out of my advocacy by not being as visible as I could, excuse me, as I could be. And even as somebody who is like professionally trans, that's still a constant ongoing struggle. And it does shape the whole conversation. So I think that it gets really simplified and becomes this binary of like, are you out? Yes or no. And I just really don't identify with that question, I guess. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Oh, go ahead, Sky. Oh, Han, you bring up a, a great point that I actually hadn't thought about. Um, and I, I, part of what you say really resonates, you know, there's this whole you know, what is the other option if, if you're not visible? And then there's also accessibility, like, is it even safe for you to be visible? And then what's going to happen to your future if you are visible? Like, sadly, that's not the way we should be thinking about it. But the reality is that there could be consequences. That's just, you know, the truth. That's just honesty right there. Um, and that's something that I actually thought about before I accepted the job at Pacific Pride Foundation. I was like, okay, I really like my goal is to be in this community and continue my work in this community. Um, and I knowing that it's also not the easiest thing to always find work, <laughs> this type of work, um, depending on where you're living, that's another thing. And then thinking about, you know, where am I gonna end up? Um, obviously I wanna end up in a state or in a city that's very welcoming, that's supporting of the community that where there's actual community. So then, you know, there's all these moving pieces of it. Um, and so I, while I recognize the, uh, like the privilege and um, the actual importance of being visible, it's sort of like for ourselves, what is, where, where's that line, you know, when, when can you cross it and when can you not? And it's like constant environmental scanning, whether you're at, you know, at work, if, if you're not, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be working within community and for community. So I don't have to think about those things anymore. Um, but, you know, at least for those 40 hours of work, um, but it's like if you don't have that kind of workspace and you're constantly scanning at work, you're constantly scanning in your personal life, you're constantly having to choose who you're going to be around, if they're going to be accepting, and then do you want to go that extra mile to explain, to have to explain sometimes, you know, what what this means, you know, there's also all of that. So um, I think personally, when I think about visibility, I think about a lot of my identities, I think about like, you know, I'm Latinx. Um, not a lot of people in the Latinx community even have visibility with different sexualities, yet alone different genders. And so for me, it's super crucial to be visible where I can because I wish that I had somebody in my life growing up like that looked uh, non-binary or that was trans because I didn't even know that was a thing that existed. And if I would have known at like age five, I would have voiced that and maybe my parents maybe would have been like, oh, what is this about like let's like you know sky isn't just a tomboy <laughs> you know there's all these things going on behind the scenes so part of me is like you know I really want to be visible because if somebody is struggling with that I would like them to be able to voice that and know that and feel empowered to do that you know in that moment and and have somebody to just not guide them but have somebody that looks that looks like how they want to look basically and feel how they want to feel um but at the same time you know there's only one of me and there's you know there's community and there's so much work left to do it's not just like oh i can be your role model um and then it'll be perfect it's like there's all these other things that will come after the fact uh once you get the support and once you're able to be comfortable with your gender so you know it's 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 a it's very conflicting. So it's like, it's very important to be visible, but at the same time, it's like, there's a cost to it sometimes and there could be repercussions. And um, 
I think as a whole community, it's very important for us to be visible. We need to show up to places when, where we can, when they're safe places. Um, and we need to show folks that, you know, we need to normalize this type of, you know, pronouns, we need to normalize pronouns, we need to normalize just fluidity across all levels, but it's, it's gonna take a while to get there. So I resonated. Oh, go ahead. Go. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just wanted to, to echo sort of what you were saying this guy with the, the environmental scanning, I think is, it's one thing that is really difficult and that I personally struggle with because I find there's this, you want to be out and you want to be open and you want to be that person who's always teaching your colleagues, but it's also exhausting being the person who's always there teaching and it's always your job to, to step in and, and, you know, sometimes you don't necessarily know if it's a safe time to come out and, and, you know, correct someone or, or to, to be that one. And sometimes you just don't want to be that teacher. Like you, you don't want to take that on at the time. So I think, I think what you guys, Hugh and Han have already said, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, I can definitely echo those feelings for sure. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And as y'all were speaking, I found myself relating to a lot of the things that y'all were saying, uh, especially like around anxieties of being a graduating senior and like going out into the workforce trying to look for another job it's something i think about a lot like wow do am i going to be vis should i be visible should i choose if, if that's even a thing like am i gonna have the option to choose to be visible do i have to be visible in the anxieties of like being outed and whatnot um so yeah that is all very real what y'all were talking about and it also made me think about like you know things aren't normalized yet like i feel like we do so much work around pronouns and I think I feel like UCSB well the spaces that I'm in anyways are pretty good about like incorporating pronouns but sometimes when I do like hop into a zoom meeting for one of my classes and I don't see anyone's pronouns on their like display name I'm like oh do I choose to put him like should I be that visible person to maybe encourage someone else to like write theirs in as well or should I just not for fear of outing myself but yeah that just made me think about this next question and so there's still confusion of what being trans means. Uh, what do you feel society needs to understand about the trans community? Uh, and Han, if you would like to start, go ahead. Is anybody else ready to start? I think I need to think about it. Sure, I can jump in because this is something that I've, uh, I'm always trying to struggle against is, is this idea that transgender is a very modern term and it's a very Western uh, term and way of categorizing sort of gender nonconformity, but uh, people think this is sort of a, a new idea. And I hear all the time that this is some new thing that's come out, they're coming up with new terms and new gender identities. But uh, in, in my research and what I've done is like, this is something that has existed in the past for, for thousands and thousands of years in almost every culture around the world since prehistory, we see some form of, of gender nonconforming, uh, you know, behavior or, or name for some gender nonconforming people in, in some way. So. That is something that that I see all the time. People making these comments, and um, it's just not true. And so I, I definitely want to uh, educate people more in that area, where uh, people can understand that you know this is something that's existed for a long, long time in different forms, in different ways, under different names. But it, it's not something that's new. Um, in, in my work, actually, um, as part of a community education coordinator, we do trainings and we do a pre-assessment. And one of the questions is like, you know, what, um, what, what does it mean to be trans? And this is one of the questions that folks uh, get wrong, like the majority of the time. So it's, it's, an, it's a perfect opportunity to <laughs> be able to come in and, and explain, you know, and, and clarify some of these things. And the common misconception is that, trans is just like you're a woman you want to be a man or vice versa there's like this true like binary happening which you know we know binarism is a thing um but what folks have a really hard time understanding is that there is no like you know uh org chart that's like strict um there is no like you have to have surgery you have to do this and i think that's something that folks think about, you know, trans, oh, they, they went, they underwent surgery. And it's, that's most likely not always true. You know, it's very hard to get, be able to get to that point to be able to afford surgery. Um, and then there's this whole level of hormones that people don't understand where people can simply just 
take hormones, whether it's a cream or, or a shot. Um, and so people just think that they want to go the extreme way and they want to go all the way. And there's just this whole non-binary and gender non-conforming invisibility that happens even within the trans community because you know, there, there's this middle area, there's there's a spectrum and not everybody wants to identify with that binary. Um, and, you know, and there's people that are and that's okay, but I think that um, people really get confused about what it truly means. Um, and, and people also think, oh, it's just people who dress differently than what they're born with. And it's just like, you know, there's pronouns, there's this whole thing behind it. And so I, I feel very fortunate that I get the opportunity to see that pre-assessment. And then I'm like, yes, I get to, tell you know 20 people today what this actually means and break it down for them and tell them how important um, gender expression is and tell them how important um, affirming names is the pronouns and all that and they walk away at least being exposed to the information <laughs> whether they're you know practicing it who knows I hope so um, but you know Natalie it's it's very interesting that you bring up you know the history because even though this has, is not a new thing it's it's very confusing for <laughs> others who are not in our community. I, I love that you're doing that work to help people even just grapple with the the basic ideas. Um, and yeah, I think I think kind of to go in an opposite direction, um, one of the things that I end up bringing in to trainings with therapists particularly is I hear this sensitivity that that cis people want to be respectful of trans, uniqueness by saying like, I know that I could never sympathize. I could never understand what it's like to be trans. And it's like, well, okay, kind of, but there's a lot that we have in common. Um, and it's really important not to, to sort of cement trans people as these just like incomprehensible aliens um, <laughs> that are totally separate. And so one of the tools that I developed for teaching therapists about trans identity is a gender exploration tool that is designed for cis people who have never grappled with their gender. Um, and it asks the sort of things that we've thought about if we've, <laughs> if we've had to really grapple with where do I want to be um in in gender in the world in the context that i'm in so but it's also things that most people have thought about in some way like um what's the name that you're usually called what's the name that you like to be called the most is it the same as that um is there a name that you've been called in your life that you don't like what does it feel like to be called that and for some people that's like oh well my name is is thomas and sometimes people call me tom um, but I used to be called Tommy when I was a really little child and that was okay. But if somebody calls me Tommy now, I feel like it's infantilizing. It's like, yeah, great. That is actually a point of connection for our identities. That's like, it's not, it's not that strange, you know, it's not that different from what you've experienced. And so I'll ask people things like, what do you like about being your gender? What do you not like about being your gender? And then we'll have conversations and particularly in mixed groups that brings up a lot of stuff because one of the things that I often hear from cis women is I couldn't think of a thing that I like about my gender. Being my gender is awful and cis men will be very surprised by that. And sometimes cis men will say things like, you know, what I really like about being my gender is I can go jogging at night and that's great for me. Um, and so we can see like the way that we experience our gender is not just a relationship with our bodies. It's a relationship with how we're addressed by others. It's a relationship with structures of power. It's a relationship with space. It's a relationship with clothing. There's a lot of gender feelings in pants for people of all genders and gender modalities. Like pants have a lot of gender meaning in them. <laughs> and pants shopping maybe even more than just pants so like this is something that we can connect on and honestly if we can talk about how hard it is to buy pants for our gender and our body and our experience and our identity and our sense of, se sense of self-worth that's a place that we can connect and say like great that's a starting point and it seems kind of ridiculous to talk about like the trans liberation solidaristic potential of pants shopping 
but like pants shopping is not working for everyone and that's not the only thing about gender you know <laughs> Yeah, I just want to say real quick that I have still not found a pair of pants that fit me right. So I'm just going to the conclusion that I'm going to have to get them like tailored and fixed. But yeah, y'all bring up a lot of great points. And I really like held on to what you said, Natalie, about just the definition of like what being trans is itself is rooted in like so much white and Western like ideologies and like expectations that even just like the definition itself already puts an expectation on like how someone should look like sky you were saying like it's very binary still and yeah no there's not one way to be trans there's no correct way to be trans there's like you don't have to do the hormones or surgery there's no right there's no right way basically it's your own journey and that's kind of what i want to leave off with i do have to hop off um so i will hand it over to Dwayne. but Thank you all so far, and yeah, for giving me this opportunity to facilitate for this time. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Erin, thank you for all of the work that you've done for the trans community at UCSB and beyond. You're a star, and I wanted to say that before you leave. Oh, thank you, Han. Back to you. <laughs> Alrighty, bye everyone. Thank you so much, Erin. We appreciate you. Bye. bye. So resuming with the next uh, next question um, is what specific issue that might normally go unnoticed or unreported would you like to call attention to and why? And I know there might be like a multitude of things that are popping up, but if there's one in particular that you wanted to highlight. Most trans people are not straight. And I keep seeing trans 101 kind of approaches that are like, did you know trans people can also be gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, queer, plus. And it really posits a normative trans identity that is straight. Um, and it's this ironically cis-centric trans mode that's like, well, most cis people are straight. So obviously most trans people are also straight. And it's grounded in the pathologization of trans identities and the forced norming of trans people within like US and European medical history that like there was a time not that long ago where in order to access surgical and medical transition services, you had to be heterosexual, um, monogamous, attractive in the eyes of your doctor, which should not be part of a medical chart in any ever, but was, that was normal. And so like, particularly for people who are transitioning as women, um, it would be like, well, I don't think she could succeed as a heterosexual housewife, so she can't be a woman. And there was a very literal policing of the bounds of gender legitimacy around heterosexuality and attractiveness and thinness and whiteness that continues to impact how we think about trans identity. And I think it's really important to think about trans identity as not being just like weird cis people in the same way that it's really not okay to think about women as just weird men in the way that like the ancient Greeks did. Like this is the root, <laughs> Aristotle thought that women were just pathological men and it shows in how women were treated socially. And so like, we can't, we can't um, address the inequalities without addressing the philosophies that underpin them. And so like, actually most trans people are queer. We've counted, we know that for sure. Some trans people are straight and they're valid. And I hope that they have great relationships with their straight partners or their bisexual partners or their pansexual or asexual partners. I support them. And they're actually the smaller group within our community. And so, it's important for us to be aware that like, we're not just cis people with weird bodies. Like that is a really pathologizing frame. We're different and that's great and it's fine. So yeah, um, trans people are highly likely to be queer and it's fantastic. One thing that I always try and call attention to and, and working in the field of sort of emergency support services is um, I'm always encouraging others 
is either at UCSB or outside to look at the barriers that are in place, the systemic barriers uh, to our emergency services, to our healthcare that have been put in place that sort of limit trans people from being able to access those services. And they might not um, necessarily block trans people from doing that, but anything that discourages someone from reaching out uh, makes them feel uncomfortable. In the, the case of emergency housing services, most emergency uh, housing uh, is sort of gender divided, either strict male or female. You've got women's emergency services and you've got everyone else's emergency services. And uh, that is a barrier for a lot of people to reaching out. And in, in my role, I've seen uh, trans people reach out looking for housing and, and have had a lot of concerns about, you know, where am I gonna go? Am I gonna be placed here or here? And so a big push for this year for um, UCSB is, is a goal of breaking down some of those barriers around uh, emergency services, uh, making things less binary, working with other um, non-campus resources to sort of examine those barriers. And, and in some cases, I understand it makes sense. There are religious reasons or people who are coming from bad situations who would prefer to be with someone of the same uh, sex as them. And that's totally fine, but it doesn't need to be exclusionary. We need to have sort of alternate uh, you know, options available for people so that trans youth and trans people who are in need of resources can feel comfortable reaching out and, and looking for those resources. And I know Han, you've talked a lot about um, the medical field as well has a lot of the same issues with resources and, um, and just accessibility and barriers that have been put in place for no reason. I think for me, I'll just add a little bit. Um, I have a background in human resources and I think that the onboarding process in general can be very tedious um, and in some, some places can be unwelcoming, but it's definitely more unwelcoming for folks who are part of our community. So I think that um, there has to be some sort of curriculum that should be mandated with all HR uh, groups for you know big orgs or small orgs that really, you know, train people in that department as well as onboard people who are part of a community in a, not in a different way, but in a way that, um, you know, makes them, makes it easier for them to be able to understand insurance and makes it easier for them to be able to connect with doctors in the area who might be able to support them, you know, if people need to continue their hormone therapy, how, how can that, um, how can they get information about that, the resource? So there's a lack of information. There's a lack of just smooth, uh, a smooth transition between, you know, coming into a, a new workplace um, and making sure that they have that support. And unfortunately, in most places, like you just don't see that, um, bless you doing, in most places, you just don't really see that um, alone, just sometimes for cis people, but so it's even uh, less of a, it's a disadvantage for folks who, you know, are coming in who already probably might feel really nervous and anxious about being in, in this new workplace and struggling with, you know, should I be visible? Should I not be visible? But then now having to go that extra mile to find those resources, I think it should just be more accessible. Well, thank you all for sharing. And I think you bring amazing points up of like looking for assessments of safety, the way in which we're being folks are being perceived by um, communities who really aren't a part of them. So as we get closer, I wanna be conscious of the time as we wrap up. So I'm gonna read one more question. If our audience members have any other questions that they might have, feel free to type those in the chat. But as we transition out, um, do you have any advice for some folks in the audience who may be coming to terms with their identity or beginning to transition now or in the process of transitioning? And if so, what is like the process of transitioning? I guess my advice would be, you know, uh, as we've talked a little bit about before, there's not really one right way to do anything. So uh, get connected with the community. Um, there's lots of different groups out there. Uh, Lisa's Place, SB10 in this area, uh, no matter where you are, I guarantee there's some sort of um, community of, of trans people there uh, to, to reach out and, and bounce ideas off of other people and, and don't be afraid to experiment and try new things and, and change your mind about, you know, what you might decide to identify with or, or what labels you want to use. Uh, there's no right one right way to do this. So. I want to plus one to it is okay to change your mind. 
it can feel so frightening um, to say, okay, everybody, I, this is my name, this is my gender identity, this is the, the language that is right for me. And then to three months later, feel like, you know what, actually, this is not working. I need to go do a different thing. Like I need to alter and, and I think that because of narratives about like trans trenders and um, detransitioning and all of these ideas that are in um, like just public debate, it can feel really scary to not be certain. And it can feel like you have to have one answer and then that's the answer that applies to your whole life from birth to death and there's no more changes ever. But the reality is a lot of people go through periods where they're like, I think that it's this. And then actually I've found this other thing that works better. Or like, this was great for me for two years and then I needed a different thing. Or like, you know what? I really wanted, I have a friend who, who chose a name that really speaks to their ethnic heritage. And they were really excited to have a name that was very traditional. And then they were like, I just want to order a Starbucks. Like, I actually don't care anymore. I just want a name that other people can pronounce. And it's fine. Like, it's totally fine. Um, a lot of people end up changing and it can be so, so frightening. And I just want to tell you, like, you're not hurting other trans people if you change your mind. You're not, um, you're not a bad trans person. You're not fake. You're not trendy. It, it's so, 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 so normal and it's okay. And even if you changed much more often than other people around you, and it's not an average experience, it's okay to have a not average experience. So um, I think like trust your own wisdom and how fast you wanna move. You might be going fast or slow compared to people around you. And either of those is okay. Um, I, I had a friend who woke up one morning and said, you know what? I'm a woman and I'm going to rework my entire life. And now this is what's happening. And I was like, oh my God, I find that terrifying. Because for me, I was like, I had a thought about it. And then six months later, I had a conversation about it. And then a year and a half after that, I started telling people that I was maybe possibly a little bit trans in the, a little bit, but not like trans trans, but like a little trans. Does that a thing? I don't know. I don't want to be like offending real trans people. And then like, another eight months later, I started hormones. Like it was such a slow process for me of like obsessively journaling every single day about how I felt about transitioning. And you know what, me and my friend are both as, as good with our transitions. Like these are both fine ways to approach it. And so whatever gets you where you're going is good. And the process itself is a really beautiful experience, no matter what you end up with. So I think like, yeah, it's a terrifying uncertainty to face in a culture where we're often expected to just know things. And it's fine to not know, it's just fine. Just to wrap up really quickly to echo Han and Natalie, as my partner would say, try it on for size. You know, buy a bra, buy a boxer. You wanna buy a packer, try it out, why not? You can, you know, especially right now we're in COVID, we're, we're at home most of the time. This is the perfect time to be able to explore and just make sure that you, you pick your safe uh, spaces, you know, pick your friends that you trust that you know will support you and show it off. If that feels good, then it feels good. And then if in a year it doesn't feel good and you throw it on, you try something new on. There's, there's no rules, there's no linear way to do this. Uh, just whatever feels more you is what I would suggest to do. Thank you all so much for these wonderful answers. Like, it's like making me smile, especially because like, I have been having conversations with folks recently about identifying as non-binary and what that looks like. And do I even qualify because of blah, 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 like the same questions that y'all are answering. So I think everything that y'all have said is absolutely wonderful. Um, so I want to be conscious of time, but there was one question in the chat. So um, uh, a friend is wondering about resources for trans parents. Uh, so Han, I saw. Um, regarding not trans enough, um, I had the privilege of hosting a space for young trans people that was like 30 or 40 trans folks who were together after something had happened. And every single person in the room had been told by other trans people that they were not trans enough and that they were transitioning wrong. And there's a lot of hurt in our community and a lot of fear about 
contributing to transphobia by doing things wrong. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that these narratives often come from within the community as much as they often come from without the community. And it can feel really scary and isolating for somebody who's exploring their gender or in early transition, who is afraid of like stepping on other trans people's toes. And it's hard to find that balance of being accountable to other people, but also having the space to explore. And I just wanna say like, if you're in a space where somebody's telling you that you're transitioning wrong, um, I think that that person is probably incorrect. Um, and I encourage you to find a space where there's more room to explore and more room to experiment because it is already really hard without that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, that person is me. So I just got to have that conversation with myself. <laughs> Fire the cop in your head, Dwayne. <laughs> A cab. But with that being said, so thank you all so much for joining us. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that y'all want to say before we leave? Um, any kind of last tidbits of wisdom that you might have? Or if not, just a nice fun sign off. I want to say thank you so much for, for having us and, and letting us do this and organizing this, Dwayne, and, and for Aaron as well. Um, you know, we really appreciate it and we're always happy to speak. Uh, about this. This was a great opportunity. Thanks, Twain. It's such a pleasure to see all of your faces and I hope you have a really wonderful and safe spring. Is that, is that what we're doing? I think spring. Uh, well, awesome. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, audience members, for joining us. Again, really appreciate all this time. Um, just as a reminder, uh, Trans Day of Visibility is right around the corner, um, and we're offering a whole slew of programming with Trans Month of, Visi Trans Month of Visibility programming, including voice and communication workshops, more guest speakers, more spaces. So if y'all are interested, please hit us up on our website, hit us up on our social media. But with that, uh, I bid y'all adieu, and thank you everyone so much. Bye.